you've got prejudices and common purpose is going to deal with them and this lady tells you it unsettled her. I can tell you that a lot of senior people who've got involved with common purpose have gone on to have some form of mental problem. Maria Wallace disappeared and was not particularly well and that's reported by people close to her. Bishop of Exeter is another one. Just more quotes. I'm going to jump through some bits. Very big com companies involved. Vodafone. But we started to see some information saying that not only did Common Purpose have a cell network set up across UK, but they were now starting to link UK with Europe. And this little paper says, I work for Common Purpose International. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Common Purpose International. It's remarkably close to the Communist Party International. I work with Common Purpose International as a development director and basically we are setting up with links with France and they're linking with Lille in France and they're starting to join together the networks of Common Purpose leaders. So your local democratic government is being hollowed out from the inside whilst these people talk to each other, not only across UK, but now over into Europe. We've got other documents which show exactly what they're doing. Here's the big guns. Deborah Hermer, press office, prime minister's office. She says, it was the most stretching and thought-provoking course I've ever been on. Too right, because she's had her brain scrambled. We've got people who are saying, common purpose changed my whole world. And boy, do they like children. So this is yet another course. This isn't crossed out, by the way. Somebody did a highlighter on it. This programme targets young people who have already shown evidence of leadership skills in civil society. Perhaps I'm getting old, but it seems to me that children at the moment lack the basics of leadership. They're not showing leadership skills, they're showing signs of being out of control, losing values. So what is this political charity doing playing with school children? I think we're going to need to change the tape fairly shortly. So on that note, I will pause. And while we're changing the tape, I'm very happy to answer some questions. As a general rule of thumb, I've noticed that the more an organisation talks about diversity, the less it practices it. <laughs> That's also true in the North, in the North American continent. Yep. Um, you know, you'll produce, for example, a candidate who is black, yep. who is female, who is even disabled, you think would be ideal and then they will be vetoed because they have the wrong political opinions. Now, of course, there are organisations closer to home. For example, I'm a member of the Conservative and Unionist Party, where you can produce someone who's black, female, disabled. No chance at all of getting on the candidates list if they have the unprogressive political opinions. So, by diversity, I would put it to you that they mean the opposite of diversity, they mean uniformity, agreeing with us 100% or else? This is a very good question. This is a very good question because it was a little area that we decided to look at. And in fact, um, we've got uh, some emails where Common Purpose, mm. what, what they were asked is how many people over 50 do you employ? That's what we went for because they talk about age is no barrier. They wouldn't answer the question how many people do you employ in your London office over 50? They wouldn't answer the question. Then the lady said that um, they were going to have a meeting about it and we would get an answer. And they had the meeting and we still didn't get an answer. Then it was going to go to their board who were going to give us an answer and we never did get an answer. Why would they be so frightened of how many people over 50 they did or didn't, they didn't employ? But the other thing is that on the ground, they say they are for diversity, 
and you do see coloured people, however you want to describe them, Muslims or whatever, involved, but the people who are within common purpose itself, I'm not politically correct, and if I was some, with some of my other friends here, it would work better, but if they're coloured of whatever nationality that means, then it is their political view that's the most important one. So you're absolutely spot on. And they're very frightened when you ask them this question. I could answer your question about the age factor. Of course, first of all, if they are practicing age discrimination, that's a criminal offence now, which is worth examining. Um, but there's also another point, which may sound slightly paranoid, but it happens to be true. As someone gets older, you lose many things, but you do gain one thing. It becomes progressively harder and harder to condition you. It's about the only advantage of getting older. Yeah. So if your primary purpose is to condition people, the last people you want on earth to deal with are people who are getting on in years, because yeah. you have to work so much harder to actually condition them. Another good point, and the other thing is that your age allows you to remember life before versus what it is now. We're ready to go, to go again. If I okay. just comment, don't do you get too to... hot on the ages and things, because all my staff are under 30. <laughs> okay. Do you want to just do two more questions, just while we're waiting? Because I think there's a couple of gentlemen there. Okay. okay, good. Who, who else has another question? We had two side by side there, so let's uh, go two sides and one side. As a result of your activities and the fact that you are ex-service, are you or have you been the subject of any inquiries by the government security services and are you aware that are there any files on what you are doing? Uh, I'm certainly aware that there are files on what I'm doing because when I initially wrote to the security services, there's no great secret to this. I'm allowed to say that because of what I did when I'm showing you my hunt for a Red October bit, I, I have been security cleared to in my day to a pretty interesting level and that means that I everything about me is known. It also means that if I make a statement on things that I've seen I'm, I should be treated as a reliable witness. Not only was I making a statement, I had a corroborating witness making a statement as well. We wrote to the Directorate of Naval Security where we know that some things happened but most interestingly they eventually wrote us a letter back saying, well, Common Purpose was a charity, and if I had a problem, I should contact the Devon and Cornwall Police. But we already knew that Devon and Cornwall Police were riddled with Common Purpose. So I found out by putting a few letters out that there was something very wrong within the security services. And I will stand by that, because although he's had a lot of bad press recently, um, David Shaler and his girlfriend from MI5 um, in talks they do, say that far from protecting the public, the public now needs protecting from the security services. So yes, there is definitely files on me, and I can also tell you that I have interesting things happen to me, but I don't get threatened anymore. Because there are special branch offices at most manned police stations in this country, and yeah. Yes. Yeah, but it, you cannot even get fraud dealt with through Devon and Cornwall Police for a variety of reasons. There's one of my difficulties is I'm watching my watch. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave that question there. Let me get through the rest of it. Okay, I'm going to go as quickly as I can and then we'll open it up. Okay, so school children, particularly vulnerable. A um, bit of fun here. Uh, I am very suspicious of all political parties, okay? I just go by ordinary people now, what their views are. I don't mind whether you're a Conservative or Labour. Are you a good person? But um, UKIP has been doing a lot, supposedly, at the higher levels. And here is Lehman Brothers involved with Common Purpose. Now, Lehman Brothers, I think I'm correct in saying that a chap called Lithgow, who's the uh, new public relations officer for UKIP worked for them at one stage. I think that's true. I may be wrong. Here's the police again. Fife Constabulary, Chief Constable Peter Wilson. Um, he is um, totally involved in Common Purpose and he's getting involved in anti, or, or in the policing of anti-poverty 
um, activity. Whenever there's anything political going on, like with Miss Cressida Dick, it seems that common purpose people are very keen on it. This is the, ch the teaching sided, uh, side of it again. Um, this is IPPR at work, but uh, we've got a variety of people coming together talking about the future of the teaching profession. And if we look at the people involved in that dialogue on the future of the teaching profession, bang, up we come with Julia Middleton, the Chief Executive of Common Purpose. This lady's everywhere. She's all over the country. <laughs> she knows everything there is to know about leadership. She's never done a proper day's job in her life because she's been through the political system, but she's in every, everything going, telling you how to run your life. And here we've got Matthew Taylor from IPPR that seems to have sucked on a million pounds of money that's disappeared. This one's to do with Mr Taylor himself, political strategy, and this is common purpose dealing directly to Downing Street to line itself up with meetings. It's a pretty good charity. Here's common purpose in a pally letter to Ruth Turner. And this is a bit of text which is talking about the dome. Common purpose citizens connection is linked to the shared ground zone at the dome made possible by Camelot. Have you ever wondered why ever, all of a sudden they got keen on the lottery? The lottery was created because it's a perfect way of laundering money. You take money, you end up with billions of pounds and then you give it to all the causes you want to give it. And they are giving it to causes which are helping to break the country down. That's why the local WI who needs a new hall doesn't get money, but a local political group of uh, immigrants will get the money. And here's good old Lord Falconer. Now, I, I, I haven't got time to show you more on Lord Falconer, but Lord Falconer has been intimately involved with diversity and common purpose. And, of course, he was intimately involved in the setting up of the law courts in order to protect children. And you will have seen recently big articles in the paper about children being taken away to meet government targets. Have you all seen that? Well, it's been in all of the major papers. We have got proof that public um, organisations, city councils, were given targets by the government and the more children they took away from their parents the more money they've got. If you go into an area and have a quick look you find common purpose. I spent about five minutes on the internet the other day looking at the South East. This is the South East of England Development Agency. I was a bit surprised at that. It's got 1,182 papers on foreign policy. Why? Do you know why? Because the European Union has told all of our regional organisations to start developing their own foreign policy because they're going to deal directly with Brussels. We weren't spotting people. Here she is. This is the lovely Julia Middleton. It's not a very nice photograph of her. If she sends me a better one, I'll change it. This is a South East of England Development Agency board meeting. A uh, load of subjects, but here's Julia Middleton, oh, right next to Prince's Trust. I believe that's Prince Charles's uh, favourite little one, isn't it? So here's this lady. She was educated in France and Switzerland. She came to England. She started to work for the Work Foundation, which many people would regard as socialist. She then goes to Demos. Then she's got half a million pounds, and then her charity is everywhere. And if you look at the board, I quickly spotted a name I'd seen elsewhere, Mr. Faruqi. And here's Mr. Faruqi. And if you read the text on him, he's never been elected to anything in his life. He is a professional person. He's been on the Learning and Skills Council, the British Urban Regeneration Association. Um, he was the chief executive of the London Borough of Southwark. But he's never been elected democratically and he's now earning a fortune and he's common purpose. 
What's going on is this country's being attacked. And they are doing it by taking over things from the inside. And when you complain and you stamp your feet and you say, my local paper won't print my letter, I laugh. Of course they won't print the letter because the, the editors are common purpose or, as this gentleman suggests, a similar type of organisation. But basically, the European Union is attacking us and it's everywhere. Society, family, military, police, you name it. They have got into the grain. And that is why it is pointless jumping up and down and complaining about the European Union over there in Brussels. That isn't the problem. That's like an army waiting to invade. The problem we've got at the moment is the threat is in this country. When you know where to look for it, it becomes a much happier picture because when you know where the enemy is, where you know where that submarine is, you can deal with it. This is what they're working to. They are working to undermine, demoralise and destroy this country so that we are subsumed into the European Union. Now I was in the car the other day with a guy who's done a lot of good work for us and we're driving along and he said to me, Brian, what do you think these people are playing at? Do, do are they, what are they doing? Are they playing politics? Are they, are they out for personal gain? And I said, just run that by me again. And he repeated it. Well, he didn't know what they were, you know, what, what are they doing? And I said, they're going to kill you. These people are not playing a game. What do they want to do to you? They want to destroy you completely. Because the destruction, if you take the hospitals as an example, people are dying in our National Health Service as a result of it being collapsed. It's being collapsed deliberately. I'm not squeamish about this. When you do the military background, you talk about it. There's the bad guy. The aim is to kill them before they kill you. But whilst our troops at the moment are overseas in Iraq and Afghanistan, the real enemy is attacking this country. And common purpose is a key part of it. Now, I'm going to finish on this quote, but this is a quote by a chap called Beera, who was Stalin's right-hand man. And he defined psychopolitics, the art and, the, and science of asserting and maintaining dominion over the thoughts and loyalties of individuals, officers, bureaus, and the conquest of enemy nations through mental healing. He doesn't mean mental healing making you well, he means making you into a socialist. And here, by psychopolitics, our chief goals are carried forward to produce a maximum of chaos in the culture of the enemy. Our fruits are grown in chaos, distrust, economic depression, scientific turmoil. And I'm going to suggest to you that that is what you are now living in. And one of the ways that's being propagated is by common purpose. And I'll stop there if I may. Thank you very much indeed, Brian. time available to us to questions and debate. And can I abuse my position uh, as chairman by asking a question, if you will allow Sorry, me? <laughs> um, the, the question I would ask, Brian, is this. Imagine we had somebody here from Common Purpose. And let me play devil's advocate for a moment. I think what I would be saying is something along the lines of, look, we're interested in improving life in Britain by improving leadership skills. That's what we're about. So, of course, we go to organizations which are influential. We try and deliver these courses. We go to schools because we want to encourage leadership skills, and we want these young people to grow up and take leading positions in our society. We have a series of programs we think that make people much more effective leaders. 
So we're a bit like the industrial society, which does industrial training, but we focus particularly on leadership. And there are other, um, both commercial and, I believe, charity organisations that do similar things. Uh, common purpose just happens to be a big one and a successful one. And then you say, well, okay, you're teaching people about the European Union. This is propaganda. And they will say, well, we're teaching people how decisions are made that affect their lives, and whether you like it or not, uh, a great many decisions are made in Brussels, just as a great many decisions are made in Westminster. Therefore, if we're teaching people about how decisions are made in society, of course we're going to teach them uh, about how the European Union works, and we're going to take them to the Parliament. We are just a training organisation. And of course we have links with other think tanks who work on areas like this. Of course, because we're successful, we get into large companies, we get companies supporting us, uh, and we work to an extent with the government because they've seen the benefit of the wonderful training that we deliver. Now, if they were to say that to you, how would you respond? Well, I'd say um, that is a wonderful description of common purpose, but there are some points at the moment which don't seem to tie up. The first one is that if you're a charity, it's very reasonable that you do your work in an open way where we can see where your money is coming from and how you're using that money. You are, after all, a charity. And the overwhelming proof and evidence at the moment is that you're exceedingly, exceedingly secretive about where your money is coming from and how that money is used. On top of that, I'd like you to explain why it is that when we ask a city council, such as Plymouth City Council, how much you've spent on common purpose, instead of saying, we are delighted to tell the public that we have spent £200,000 and we think it's excellent value, they don't want to tell us how much they've spent. Now that's rather odd, isn't it? Because you run a wonderful charity but nobody wants to tell us how much they've spent. In fact, it's taken Philip Davis as an MP to ask questions in the House to discover how much the MOD has spent or how much the Department of Social Services has spent. Yeah. So it's rather odd that we have a charity where everybody seems very reluctant to, to say how much they've spent on it. Mm. The other thing is that if you are a Freemason, yeah. you are required to declare yourself but common purpose is training people to be graduates. I'd suggest a better word is members. And yet far from declaring themselves and saying, I am a common purpose person and what a brilliant charity and I'd encourage all of you to join. Yeah. They don't want they to do declare you. themselves. Funny enough, I've written down here, like the Mason's question mark. So Absolutely. that comparison is interesting. One yeah. of the things that I can and will do as an MEP, I will do a written question to the commission saying, are you aware of this organization and have you provided any funding? And I think, although I have no great regard for the European Commission, um, usually, in my experience, they do give fairly straight answers to those questions. So that would be a question worth asking. Right, I will stop abusing my position as chairman and we'll go, sir, can we uh, have your question? Yes, uh, my name is Frank Leeming. I'm a former Senior Engineer Officer, Ship Senior Engineer Officer in the British Mercantile Marine. I am a former Magistrate. Currently, I am an independent council on Derby City Council. I have been approached by this group and asked to go on one of their courses. I read their literature. This was given to me or sent to me by email officially from the council and Derby City Council are promoting this through their workforce and to all councils. I started to read it and then being a Yorkshireman I saw how much it was going to cost me which was a little over £5,800 and I binned it. Purely for that reason I don't see any point in me spending £5,800 at my time in life to listen to what's going on from these people. However, Mr. Gerrish, when I was invited to this meeting and I was told your name, a little bell started to ring in. I thought, Paul Gerrish, Portsmouth, surely that's the chap who writes that little newspaper 
which is full of libelous statements about the corruption that's going on in Portsmouth Council. Plymouth. Plymouth, Plymouth Council. Yeah. Plymouth. And I thought, right, if he's still here, yeah. those libelous statements must be true. So therefore they can't be libelous, so the bloke is telling the truth. He's not been arrested, not been sent into prison, not had his house taken by the bailiffs because he can't pay the fines or the court bills. So, so I thought, yeah, I couldn't listen. I couldn't listen to what he's saying. I am totally amazed at what you've said. I had an inkling that this organisation was similar to Byra's organisation, and Byra was the Politburo member for all the secret services in Russia. He was assassinated by Stalin by impregnating the curtains in his flat with cyanide. And that's how they got rid of him, because he fell foul of Stalin. Third, from the description you've got, I don't see any difference in the way that he operated and the way this people operated. Their aim is the same, total domination. No democracy, no elected membership, everything governed, run by their own people selected through this programme of brainwashing. And I Could thank I, you very much for coming here. Could I just interject briefly? Um, it does cost money to hire the hall, uh, so Edward is going to go around with his hat in his hand. Well, actually, it isn't a hat, it's, it's, a, it's a coffee cup. Uh, and if you feel able to contribute to, to the... That would be an extremely fine thing. Uh, very good. I'm sorry. Just right respond to... Respond to, to uh, um, Thank you very much for saying what you've said. This is, and I've brought up quite a lot of copies, this is the newspaper that I run. It, it was the Devonport and Plymouth column. We've now made it the UK column because it's going all over the place. Um, there are two other papers that are working on similar lines. There's the Cornish Free Press and there's the Westminster News up in London. But we've actually been telling the truth. I've brought up this edition because in it, I've done a double page article on common purpose at work within the police force. Okay? And I will say, nobody has gone for us yet, because even though we know the judges are corrupt, or a large number of them, the evidence that we've got is overwhelming. And what we're talking about, fraud and corruption in Plymouth City Council, we can prove it. So I'll leave some of those for you to read. Excellent. Can we have another question, please? Sir, back row. Uh, could I ask, please, if you mentioned the Charity Commission. My understanding is that the Charity Commission's function is to oversee all these registered charities, and if they indulge in any malpractices, uh, to take appropriate action. Yeah. Is, is anything of that sort underway in terms of this common purpose? Or we... we uh, <laughs> We are starting to head in that direction, but we only regard that as a little bit of a game because I'm afraid to say that this country is basically on a knife edge at the moment. Every organisation which is designed to uphold standards has already been corrupted itself, and that includes the Charities Commission. A better example is if you take the... Um, the Law Society, which is designed to police the performance of solicitors and legal firms, there are 1,700 cases outstanding where people are complaining about fraud and corruption and mismanagement and abuse of all sorts of things by the legal profession. And until last year, the chief executive of the Law Society just happened to be a lady called Janet Paraskeva who just happened to be a very senior common purpose person and friend of Julia Middleton, the chief executive. Now we are now going to look at these bodies, but if you go to the police and you complain to the police, if you go and complain about the police, they send you to the police complaints body and what people are finding, not on the subject of common purpose, but on other complaints, is a wall is coming down. And the reason is that these people are already infiltrated and, these, uh, and the organisations are having the functions closed down. So you can do it, and in fact, you should still do what is the normal thing, but you have to remember 
that wherever you go, and I mean wherever you go, there is some form of political corruption in the body you go to to seek help. Right, could I just add a, 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 a rider, if I may, yeah. to that question? I mean, presumably, if they are a registered charity, the, yeah. the accounts are published. So yes. we can see at least where they claim to get their money from. Yes, and we've got... whether that's accurate. Yes. We've, we've got copies of that. We've got copies of that, but the accounts are of an abbreviated nature, and yeah. of course abbreviated accounts can conceal a great deal. Just to do a quick follow-up, yes. Well, how do you see us getting out of this situation if the whole of officialdom and semi-officialdom is riddled with these people? We're going to come up against prob a problem of, of uh, eliminating them, or <laughs> getting them out of their positions, or wherever we turn. Yeah. What can we do as individuals? Very little, I would have thought. Well, on the contrary, I think we can do a lot, but what we need to do is something different to what we've been doing to date. I will answer your question, but if I can just come in sideways. How many of you are aware that there was a major debate amongst politicians about amending, further amending the treason laws to enable debate to take place about UK becoming a republic? and that debate not being treasonous. How many of you know that debate took place? Okay, well I only found out on the way up here because somebody gave me a call. But basically, I'd give you that because nothing could be more fundamental than your elected members of parliament having a little secret debate about changing the whole fabric of the country. So I would suggest that when you go for help amongst politicians, you've got to be very sure the one you go to is going to help, because most of them, I believe, are rotten. Okay? But what most people do, and they've done in this game over the last five years, is they do the things which would make sense if the country was normal. I've got a problem, I will go to the police, they will help. The police don't help, I'll go to the police complaints. They won't help, I'll go to my MP. It's not worth a jot anymore, because all of those routes are corrupted. What we have to do is something much simpler. First of all, you need to expose what's going on. So we do ask the question about the common purpose accounts, because that takes the lid off. Oh, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? Why is that person involved? They don't like this. There's a, state, a famous saying, which I wish I had, but it says basically that no conspiracy can stand the light. The moment you've got something secret and you say, well, actually, I know what you're doing, it's not worth anything. So what we've got to do is start talking about the right things. We've got to start talking about subversion. We've got to start talking about treason. And on top of treason, we've got to start talking about what we are going to do to the people when they are caught. I regard myself as a Christian, but I am not squeamish. And by that I mean that we are watching people commit treason. We've got proof. I'm going to talk about a policeman in a minute called Albert Burgess, who's pushing for, tre for, for treason, um, charges of treason to be brought against a whole variety of people in this country. But we need to use the words. And the people we need to use the words with are people at the bottom of the pyramid. Go to your local councillor. Go to your friends next door and talk to them. And you've got to use the real word. It is very serious. The country is being destroyed. It will result in people dying because their plan is to create dis, uh, disturbance on the streets because that will allow the clampdown of martial law. That's what's coming. You must go in at the bottom and use the words, and it will then filter up. Let's try and get as many questions as we can. The gentleman in the centre at the back. Uh, yes, uh, Mr Chair. So two things I'd like to know. You mentioned uh, Peter Mendelssohn, um, Michael Herzogstein, Tony Blair, and various others. Are you saying that they are common purpose? And also, there's a lot of allegations about on the internet that uh, David Cameron uh, is singing from the same hymn sheet. Right. Um, what we're seeing is cross-party. 
There's no doubt about that. So you can forget good guys are Labour or the good guys are Conservatives right the way across the parties. No, I'm not saying that I can show you that uh, Mandelson is a common purpose mem member or so is Heseltine. What I can show to you is that every time we dig into common purpose and we start to find very dubious activities with large amounts of money and funny things going on, we start to find these names clustered around it. So I think it's known by the police as circumstantial evidence. Just deal with David Cameron. David Cameron is very, very interesting because we wrote to him some time ago asking if he'd been involved with Common Purpose and he never replied to the letter. But he is involved with an organisation called the Young Trust. And if you go and look at that on the website, you will find that the man running it is the same Jeff Mulgan. I can also tell you that Francis Maud, previous chairman of the Tory party, um, knew perfectly well what common purpose was because he admitted in front of somebody at a Conservative Party meeting that he actually knew Julia Middleton quite well. And it was the Westminster News, and my newspaper, which also pointed out to people the connections between Francis Maud's website and homosexual pornography. Could I take care of that? Thank you. Um, I'd like to give a couple of instances of how this thing is working. A little while ago in Leicester, there was a move afoot amongst the hospitals to take away the Gideon Bibles that were placed in the bedside lockers. The leaders of the Muslim and Hindu communities said they had no objection to the Bibles being there. The whole thing was put up by some equalities officer or somebody like that with an anti-Christian agenda, and that does yep. uh, fit in with your, uh, with, with your thesis. Um, again, on the preparation for, um, shall we say, civil disturbances, uh, about four years ago, I went to a remote country house in Lincolnshire by invitation through the local Federation of Small Business to a business that made aids to civil power. They got all sorts of things, little cameras that you could go behind your tie to take pictures, uh, little recorders that were undetectable, riot shields, different types of batons. Um, a special type of uh, liquid which if sprayed and you've got into your eye would put you out for 20 minutes and they were putting that past the health and safety executive to try and get clearance on that and a new type of cartridge, sub-lethal cartridge which fired something like a bit like a tea bag full of lead shot with a ribbon behind it which would replace the baton round and it could be fired from a uh, repeating shotgun. Very accurate, one of those at 50 yards and you'd be out of the count. There's no doubt about it, they are preparing for government against the people. Oh. <coughs> can I, Chairman, can I just add, add a bit on that? Because you mentioned the Muslims. Um, in December last year, I can't remember the date, but I was invited by one of the senior Muslim leaders in Britain to do a talk in Birmingham Central Mosque, uh, which I was delighted to do, because the gentleman uh, Dr. Mohammed Nazim, I've been working with for some time, and I'm delighted to tell you that the, the Muslim leaders are very well informed on what's going on in the country. But in the talk that I gave in the mosque, uh, where I didn't give as much detail as this, but I did get to the point of telling them that, in my opinion, the Muslims are being lined up to be the new Jews. So if you look at the model in pre-war Germany, it was the Jews and communists were lined up to be, the, uh, to be the troublemakers, and that is exactly what they're doing with the Muslims. And uh, I got a very interesting response from them. Oh, we, we, we have a question from a lady. We must take that. Well, we, we can certainly say that there is an amazing correlation between um, logos and how deeply a uh, organisation has been corrupted. It's almost, I use that word, it's almost like once they've got control of an organisation, they like to put their stamp on it. 
And one of the things that has been happening over a number of years is that the, the, the crest, the royal crest, has been disappearing off government papers and is being replaced with little squeaky coloured logos. I'll give you an example. Devon County, Devon County for ages, had uh, um, a wavy line, which was the sea and a ship on it. And that, that was the heritage of Devon and Francis Drake and all the rest of it. And that has now been replaced by two little green leaves, which if you say, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. So very often you will see that on a piece of official paper, you will get a logo that when you really look at it and you say, well, that's a bit tat, that's a bit sort of weird, that is a very good indication there's something strange going on in the organisation. We, we've got the gentleman um, there, sir. Do you know uh, of any publications which actually highlight your case? Uh, actually, do articles about common purpose, say like um, drive and hide, do they actually mention it? Are they exposed? At the moment, the, the only information that's coming out on common purpose is coming out from myself and David Noakes, who runs the EU Truth website. Um, although there was a gentleman, I think he was called William Clark, who wrote an excellent article in a, in a magazine called the Valiant magazine, or Variant magazine, in 2001. And he said then that on the little he'd seen, Common Purpose was a fraudulent, elitist organisation. So we are working very hard on getting more stuff published. Um, the newspapers have been a huge success because we're getting... We, well, some days now we're getting several phone calls a day of people calling us and saying, this makes sense with what I've been seeing in my hospital or my council. Could I just ask a follow-up on that? Yep. I mean, they're, they're putting presumably hundreds or maybe thousands of people through these programmes. Surely there is at least one of those people who will come out afterwards and say, I'm going to blow the whistle on this, this is what we were told. Well, we, we've actually, uh, well, this, you've raised a very good point, Some, something I'd like to just give you. Common Purpose on the major courses has got about 25, 26,000 graduates. These are people who've done at least a two-day course. And they're people I would consider to have been reasonably well indoctrinated. So we're not dealing with hundreds of thousands, but of course you only need, you only need 50 or 100 of these people in a big city and they can cause a lot of problems, all right? Having said that, just because you go on a common purpose course doesn't mean to say you're instantly uh, got. It's shades of grey. Some people, we can see quite substantial changes in them and their personalities. Other people walk away and say it's crap. Okay, so out of the 25,000, if I had to guess, I'd guess that probably only about two and a half, three thousand 3,000 people are really badly affected by it, and the others are somewhere in between. Um, we, we know that just like the religious cults, common purpose works by putting friends along people, alongside people, and they sort of steer them, yeah? I've drifted off a little bit there, but I just wanted to raise that point because I think it was an important one. But you, you asked about the numbers and there was something else. Well, I was asking somebody who would be, as it were, a whistleblower oh, yes, yeah, who would come yeah. along and say, I've been to one of these yeah. courses and I can tell you what it was like. Uh, we've got those people. We've also got people who are doing courses at the moment. The, the, out of the people who've come forward to us, uh, we've got everything There was... Um, several ladies in the initial days who were in a very bad state. Uh, I, could, I could talk about that. We've helped, we've helped them. But people are frightened. This is the key thing. This is an answer to you as a charity, is when you say to somebody, come and tell us about, I'd rather not. Instinctively, people know they've got caught up in something that's not right. They just know it. So some, some are mentally disturbed, and we've had to work very hard on those to help them get back. Others are frightened and don't want to talk, but we have got people who've talked, and we have got notes, and we are getting intelligence from inside the organisation. But if you want to, brain, if you want to brainwash somebody, um, change their views, it, it's better if they don't know you're going to do it in the first place, because the moment you know what you're looking for, 
it's all obvious. I was given a, co a course at work a couple of weeks ago, a little chit appeared on my desk and it said I was going to a reframing course. I thought, oh, that's very interesting, I'm going to be reframed. Very quickly, I'll tell you what they did. About eight of us in a room um, with two facilitators and on the table were little chits of paper with words on. Assertive, confident, happy, creative, all sorts of adjectives. And you had to pick an adjective which best suited your character. The lady I sat next to chose happy. I, I chose creative, special reason for that. And other people took other cards. And then they went round the table and you had to say why you picked the card. So the lady said, well, I'm generally happy. I enjoy making people cheerful. And I'm known as being a happy person. And the facilitator said to her, well, that, that's excellent. It, it, are there any occasions when it wouldn't be appropriate to be happy? And she's sort of, well, uh, well, well, I suppose if somebody had had something bad happen to them or, or, or a bereavement, it wouldn't be appropriate. And he said, well, that's absolutely true. And then he asked me, why did you... And I said, well, I'm quite a creative person. I like doing new things and I like challenging things. I was teasing him, but he didn't know it, basically. What he'd done to the woman was he chipped away a part of her makeup. Her, she was happy, she was a happy person. And what he'd done is put a little seed in her mind that maybe being happy isn't good. It's a tiny little seed, but it was there. We then produced two lists of everything we liked about the company and everything we didn't like. The, the like list was that, and the dislike list was that. So we pushed the like list and we just looked at the criticisms. And what we had to do was turn every criticism into a positive. So you went through and, well, that could mean that, and that's actually quite positive. So we got rid of that criticism, got rid of that criticism. Then it came down to the toilets. The toilets are a disgrace. They are dirty, ceiling tiles, wall tiles, they smell men and women's toilets. They're a disgrace. Well, that was turned into a positive because people didn't spend too long in them. <laughs> now, you laugh, you laugh, but what we're touching on is what political correctness is about. Because if toilets are dirty, there's a fundamental baseline that's not acceptable. It's not a question of how long you spend in there, they're dirty, disgusting. But what was done was everybody was gently eased into the fact, well, everything else, not a problem. That's reframing, that's taking one set of views and gently shifting it right to another set of views. And I've gently reframed you today, I hope. We've got uh, a group of people over here. I think we've got to give this side of the room a, a, a turn. Yeah. Sir? Yeah. yeah. Uh, not, a, not a question, but some quick observations on the subject of treason which you've raised, and also on a local matter. Um, starting with treason, we are at the start of a major, one of the biggest battles we've ever had to fight, and that is to fight the EU Constitution Treaty. Yep. And the basis on which we must fight that is that we already have a centuries-old constitution. And the government and other forces are playing ducks and drakes with that constitution. Now, yep. the two examples of treason, one uh, about four years ago, uh, several of us, and I think Edward was included, uh, operated, we enacted, um, we took steps <coughs> to go into magistrates' courts yeah. to exercise what is called misprision. Now, yeah. misprision is if you know of a crime being plotted and you conceal it, you can be charged and found guilty. Um, so this was a laying of information with the help of lawyers into a magistrate's court here in Leicester and elsewhere and present information uh, about treason being committed by Faulkner, Jack Straw, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, and Derry Irving. Derry Irving, because we didn't want him to hear the case against himself at that time. Now, that was my duty fulfilled in presenting information to the magistrate. The ancient um, statutory requirement is you present it to <coughs> what was then called the sheriff, yeah. and he should take over. Now, you can imagine the, the consternation but it was several weeks later 
that I was told that if I felt strongly about this, the magistrates could do nothing. If I felt strongly, I should go to the police. Now, what was the point of that? The second uh, instance of, of treason, which I've been involved in, and it comes back to changes, a uh, matter of about three years ago, when we tried through Anne Palmer to bring charges of treason. And in part of that, uh, we drew attention to the fact that foreign nationals were being recruited into the um, British police force, and magistrates uh, from foreign countries were also being appointed. Both of those against our own constitution. Both of those things are debarred. However, we discovered that this was the case and presented the evidence to, I think at that time, John Stevens, who to his credit, suspended all the magistrates. There were 22 at that time. And in a matter of a few weeks, the law was changed. And of course, it had to be changed in a sense, because otherwise, every case heard by those magistrates would have been null and void. So.